This program is made possible by a grant from the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, your local energy partner. Produced in cooperation with the Arkansas Center for Oral and Visual History. Dale Bumpers was elected governor of Arkansas in 1970 and served two terms. A survey of Arkansas historians and political scientists in 1998 ranked Bumpers as the best governor of the 20th century and the only governor of the century who merited a rating of great. He was elected to the United States Senate in 1974 where he served for 24 years. I'm Ernie Dumas. Welcome to Men and Women of Distinction, Dale Bumpers. As part of an ongoing oral history project in cooperation with the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, AETN has conducted extensive interviews with Senator Bumpers on his life and career, and we're presenting portions of those interviews to you and the viewer in a three-part series. In part one, Bumpers discusses growing up in Charleston and his life before politics. In part two, we'll discuss his years as governor of Arkansas and his historic race against Bill Fulbright for the Senate in 1974. In the third program, we'll discuss his years in the Senate and his retirement from politics. We hope you'll join us for all three episodes of this very personal and candid recollection by one of Arkansas's men of distinction, Dale Bumpers. Senator, let, let's start off with just the fundamentals. Uh, uh, where and when you were born and, and your parents? Well, I was born uh, on August the 12th, 1925 in Charleston, Arkansas. And the earliest memory I have about the size of Charleston was probably in the first, second grade when I could read numbers, but the city limit side said Charleston, population 851. And uh, I used to make jokes about Charleston couldn't grow because every time a baby was born, some man had to leave town. <laughs> but we, over the, over the years we grew, but it was a very, for the time I was the age of recollection on what I can, uh, age of memory where I can think back now and what, discuss with you what kind of a town Charleston was, the depression had set in. But in our, in our home, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have running water, we didn't have paved streets, we didn't have indoor plumbing, we didn't have anything. My dad's name was uh, William Rufus, but later as an adult, it changed to Bill. So he was Bill Bumpers, and my mother was Lattie, L-A-T-T-I-E, Lattie Jones. She's the only person I've ever known in my life who had that name, and I don't know where it came from. When they got married, uh, they moved on to a 40-acre hilltop farm, just a poor farm, and they grew a few things. Their first child was a son named Raymond, and when Raymond was three years old, he got into the garden and ate some rotten watermelon and created a terrible case of dysentery, and nobody knew, there were no doctors really of note, nobody knew what to do for this, and it was just out of control, and in the fourth day he died. My sister was about uh, maybe six months old at the time. It was Maggie, Margaret. Maggie. Margaret, that's all we ever, we never knew anything but Margaret until she left home. I, I think you kind of credit that, that uh, uh, experience with your family's decision to move to, uh, to move to Charleston. The truth of the matter is medical care in Charleston was not much better than it was on the mountain, but she thought it was, and she just, she told him, she said, I'm not going to stay on this mountaintop and uh, have babies only to watch them die. So uh, your next brother was born, Carol uh, was born after you moved to Charleston. That's right. And he was what, two or four years older than you? He's almost four, uh, about, lacking about three months, four, four years older than I am. When you were small, 
where did the, uh, the the Bumpers family stand in the uh, the kind of economic and social hierarchy of Charleston? Uh, there were a few people in town who were fairly affluent. Uh, the doctors, the banker, people like that. But my father worked as a clerk, first in a grocery store and then later in the store which he would, the, the hardware and furniture store which he would own, he and his partner would own. But he, uh, he went to work in a hardware and furniture store and also a funeral home. All hardwares had funeral homes associated with them back in those days. Why was that? Well, I think it was mostly because they built the caskets uh, and, and hardware stores were sort of a na natural, just like a lumber yard would be. It was the, the caskets would actually be built there. But when it comes to the economics of it, I think I would have to say we were better off than most. I don't know how to say it was relative, but by the same token, everybody was poor. As I said, there was no snob value in being poor because everybody was poor. Well, your father got interested in politics. Um, and I guess that's the source of your interest in politics. It was it inspired is. by your father. My father believed strongly in this country. Uh, he believed that we should go into politics. He, he told us early on that politics was a noble profession. And he said it over and over to us. And at the dinner table, we would talk politics. We'd talk about what was going on in the city. We'd talk about what was going on at the state level. We'd talk about what was going on at the national level and sometimes international. If a politician came through town and spoke on the courthouse lawn, he expected us to be there. And we'd discuss that politician's uh, speech that night at the dinner table. I don't know of any other family in the city, in the, in the town, uh, that, had, that were as wired politically as we were. It was just a thing in our household. He took you to uh, Boonville to see, uh, yes. to see Roosevelt. That's right. That would have been, what, year, about 36? That was in 38. 38. Yes, Hattie I was. Carraway was, was running for re-election to, right. to the to the U.S. Senate. We and, uh, uh, he was, I guess, there to endorse to support Hattie Carraway. Was that what? That was the purpose of Franklin the trip. Roosevelt. And so that Roosevelt was on that train, and he was going to stop in Boonville. And so that became a big issue in our house. So he took Carol and me to Boonville to to see the the president. I was 12 years old, and when he came out on the back of that train. You know, it was just godlike. I had more goosebumps on me than I've ever had in my life. I just could not believe that the President of the United States, and especially Franklin Roosevelt, was standing in front of us. And uh, it was a momentous occasion, but when he, when he came out of the railroad car onto the platform, he was obviously holding on to, uh, to the arm of his son, James. And I can remember... Uh, very well tugging on my father's arm and saying, Dad, what's wrong with him? I knew there was something wrong with him. And he said, I'll tell you later. And so on the way home, he said, now, boys, let me tell you something. Franklin Roosevelt had polio when he was 39 years old, and he can't walk. He has 12 pounds of steel braces on his legs. And he said, uh, if Franklin Roosevelt can't even walk, and has to carry 12 pounds of steel on his legs. You boys have good minds and good bodies. There's no reason why you can't be president. And, uh, you know, I've said a lot of times for my father to say that, that was tantamount to being nominated. In 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and America went to war. Dale was attending Charleston High School at the time. When he graduated, he briefly attended the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville before being drafted into the Marines. When the war ended, Dale returned to Fayetteville and completed his undergraduate studies. He then entered Northwestern University in Chicago to study law. My father, wanting me to be a lawyer, wanted my brother and me to both be lawyers. There was never any mistaking about what we were supposed to be. And the reason my father wanted us to be lawyers is because he thought that was the best, uh, best background for, to go into politics. How did it happen that you go to Northwestern? Why did you choose Northwestern? I realized if I were going to have a political career, I knew nothing about urban life. I was just a country boy. And I wanted to know more about urban politics. I wanted to know about city life. Uh, you know, of course, in the recesses of my mind, I had the presidency in mind, and I knew that you couldn't be president, certainly, unless you knew something about 
city life and I knew nothing. That's really the reason. I, and I chose Chicago. And of course, Chicago politics was unique. In 1949, while he was attending Northwestern, his mother and father were killed in a car wreck. This was a road where I-40 is now. But back then, it was a fairly narrow two-lane highway. And so there was a little hill, a crest. Dad was going up the crest, and as he kind of got to the top of the crest, here comes this roaring drunk on his side of the road, totally on Dad's side of the road. And Dad did what I, I guess most anybody do. He pulled left since the drunk was in his lane. And as drunks almost invariably do, he pulled back right. So they hit head on. And uh, my mother lived a couple of days and my father lived a week. So that was an unbelievably traumatic time. I have a tough time talking about that. Later that same year, Dale married his high school sweetheart, Betty Flanagan. He finished his law degree and then returned to Charleston. In 1951, he acquired the hardware store that had belonged to his father and opened his first law practice in the back of the store. I practiced law from that little cubicle in the back of that hardware store for two years. And I believe my gross income the first year was like $64. Your gross income from gross your law practice? Gross income from my law practice. $64. $64. You remember your first case? Yeah. Well, I remember the first fee. Uh, this old geezer came in and wanted me, he was selling a farm or something, a house. He wanted me to draw a deed. And uh, I said, fine. And this is my, uh, I'm in business now. I'm getting ready to make my first fee. So he came back. I did the deed for him. Uh, no title examination, nothing, just a deed, just a warranty deed. I drew it for him. He came back the next day and I handed it to him, and he said, how much do I owe you? I said, $5. He just went ballistic. $5? He said, that ain't nothing but a bunch of writing. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I thought we were going to have a fist fight over that, but I finally made him pay me the 5 bucks. <laughs> so you made $64 in, in, for, for 12 The months. next year, I think I grossed about twice that much. $120. Yeah. And by that time, I decided that I need to move my office. I can remember talking to people, you know, and maybe four feet away, some guy's me weighing up nails or measuring bolts or whatever, you know, and I'm sitting here talking to somebody about their troubles. Was there a problem in a small town where you grew up, knew everybody, everybody knew you as Little Dale Bumpers? Was there a problem? practicing law and, and getting public acceptance of you as a lawyer. Oh yeah, small that was the biggest part. Of it. I, I don't recommend that to anybody who grew up in a small town. I would never go back to that town to practice. I mean, people who'd known me all my life, watched me grow up, uh, they'd come in and say, ain't you a sort of a lawyer? Well, uh, in truth, that's what I was. <laughs> but I heard that, ain't you a sort of a lawyer? I, I don't know how many times. This in, in the 1950s, this, the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, requiring the desegregation of, 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 of uh, schools in the South came along in 1954. May of 54. May of 54. Uh, you were not you were not officially attorney for the school board, and you were not on the school board at that time. That's exactly not? right. But when that decision came down, there was a decision made by Charleston to desegregate, and I think you had advised them to do that. Tell me about how that happened. And I told the superintendent Woody Haynes, who's who ought to be an uh, the history books of this state. Woody came to see me and he wanted to integrate and he thought the board wanted to integrate. And I said, Woody, you can do it now or you can do it later, but you're going to have to do it. And I think it's infinitely preferable and, and to our advantage to do it now. It never occurred to me that everybody in the South wasn't going to start at least making efforts to integrate their schools. And so the board well, I'm skipping a lot of the story, uh, Ernie, but it was about July before school was to start in August or September. The school board voted to integrate the elementary and high school that fall. Of the 11 Confederate states, we were the first and one of only two, the other one being Fayetteville, to integrate in 1954 after the Brown decision 
was entered. And if you recall, the Brown decision said this order will be implemented with all deliberate speed. That's the words the Supreme Court used, with all deliberate speed. Yet all across the South, people were lackadaisical about it. They were at first terribly upset, but nobody made a move to comply with an order the court said should be complied with with all deliberate speed. We did. I believe there were three schools in, in Arkansas. I think Hoxie was one, Sheridan was one, and I forget who the third one was, voted to integrate, but then they, uh, when, when the public found out about it, they put so much pressure on the board they had to rescind the order. Three <laughs> years later, Little Rock desegregates, 1957, and uh, Orville Faubus is the governor and makes a decision to call out the National Guard to, to prevent uh, integration at Central High School in, I think, it's Labor Day of, uh, of 1957. What effect did that have on, uh, Terrible. on, on Charleston? You know, nobody in Charleston was paying much attention to what was going on in Little Rock, but I was. I sensed that as this thing began to unfold in Little Rock, and tempers began to flare and, and the volatility of the situation was evident. Uh, you know, Orville Faubus had probably 80, 85 percent approval to do what he did. Uh, in my hometown of Charleston, there was what such talk as there was was probably uh, not like it was in a lot of places, but even there, they sort of championed what Faubus was doing. I sensed it as a terribly, setting up a terribly traumatic event for us because there had been some underlying resentment among some people about what we did. And this was going to be their opportunity to undo what we did if Faubus was able to pull off the caper he was involved in in Little Rock, engaged in. Your father, your father's ambition was for you to get into politics. Yes. Practice law, get into politics. You run for state representative, uh, from Franklin County against a guy named Michael Womack. Right. Mike Womack. Uh, t why in the world did you enter that race? <laughs> I've asked myself that a thousand times. By 1962, I'd gotten sort of on my feet financially, and I thought I could afford to take the time to run. And I wanted, I thought you had to start at the bottom of the ladder. I'd started in the Arkansas legislature and in, in the House, and then maybe run for, the, for Congress and then for senator. I had no interest whatever in being governor of Arkansas. Never did have. And uh, so I thought, well, I can, I believe I can pull this off. Mike Womack was a young fellow who was, uh, uh, he was the uh, county clerk or circuit clerk, I forget which. And he had announced, and I thought I could beat him. I didn't realize that he was there for four years greeting everybody that walked into that courthouse. I knew within two days after I filed and started campaigning that that was a lost cause. And so it was like 42 to 58, something like that. And while I was disappointed, I had conditioned myself for what was an obviously inevitable loss. And I really felt that I had sort of kept my father's, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done what my father wanted me to do, and I didn't want to go through that again. I didn't think I'd ever run again. I went back to that law office the next day, never looked back, and started making money, which was my goal at that point, was to make money. And I did a pretty good job of it. For the next six years, Bumpers concentrated on his law practice and his family, which now included three children, Brent, Bill, and Brooke. In 1966, Orville Faubus retired from politics and Winthrop Rockefeller was elected, the first Republican governor of Arkansas since Reconstruction. When Rockefeller ran for a second term, Bumper's thoughts again turned to politics, and he considered entering the race, but waited until the election of 1970. Faubus came out of retirement that year to challenge Rockefeller for a third term and entered a crowded Democratic field that included, among others, Attorney General Joe Purcell, House Speaker Hayes McClurkin, and prominent lawyer Bob Compton. Faubus was favored to win the Democratic nomination when Bumpers entered the field as a virtual unknown. I wanted to run, and the field didn't worry me. Orville Faubus had created so much chaos in the state 
And I felt, frankly, that, that Orville Faubus had set this state back a, a lot of years. He was a man that I could not, I just felt that I couldn't sit home remembering a lot of my father's teachings and allow him to come back to power. I didn't think he could win against, and I thought, I thought one of the big advantages I had was not being known. It's a curious thing in politics, people will vote for somebody they don't know because they feel like he can't possibly be as bad as the ones they do know. My idea was not to overtly jump on Orville Faubus, but to simply say he had his day. And if there's anything Arkansas needs, it's a new day. You, you started off, what, just you and Archie, I guess, basically, and Archie Schaefer, who That's was your nephew. That's That's right. Uh, he had been, what, going to medical school or something and He'd dropped out? He'd been going out. to medical school and he and dropped he, out. He dropped out and came back and, 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 uh, and, and campaigned uh, with you. And it was just about it, you and Archie. That's it. Traveling the state. I was just going to the courthouses, and then I'd make the square or Main Street, and Betty was covering areas of the state that I wasn't covering, and her sister traveled with her a lot. We talked about medical practice in rural areas because most people were just like Charleston. Sometimes we had one doctor and sometimes we had none. We talked about the deplorable condition of state parks. And, uh, and I, for the first time ever, we talked about the environment. And I couched it in terms of fishermen and hunters. You won't have a place to fish. You won't have a place to hunt unless we get real and understand what we're doing to ourselves, not just for fishers and hunters, but also for our water supplies. The National Environmental Policy Act, I believe, had just been passed or was being debated. But environment, it's hard to say here 32 years later, it's hard to say how, how totally oblivious people were to the environment. It was never talked about. People were dumping their raw sewage into the Arkansas River or wherever they could find to dump it. And so I began to talk about that, and nobody else did. But those were things that really resonated with people. Started out 1% name recognition, suddenly I was at 4%. And slowly but surely, and the strangest thing about that campaign was that, that of the eight candidates, I was the only candidate that moved up. Not one soul. Joe Purcell and Hayes McClurkin started out at 14 each. And on Friday before the election on Tuesday, Hayes was at 11 and Joe was still at 14. And I had moved from that original 4% to 14%. And then, of course, the night of the election, I got 21%, which was enough to get me in the runoff against Faubus. And he was prepared to, to run against Joe Purcell, I think, in that, in that runoff. And all of a sudden, he's confronted with you. And I think his strategy was that uh, to paint you as a... What they, what they called flaming liberal. I oh, think yeah. that, was, that was the term yeah. they used. They were gonna, you were gonna, in two weeks, they were going to tell the people of Arkansas who you were. You were flaming liberal. They also used busing, uh, bu busing to achieve uh, desegregation. Yeah. It was he a big issue that. in the race as well. And he played that. He, I remember he was in Heber Springs, which I don't believe had a single black in, in the county. Maybe, maybe a few, but no, no blacks to speak of in Cleburne County. And he told him, he said, do you know, if Dale Bumpers is elected, you can plan on students being bused from Little Rock, Arkansas to Heber Springs to integrate your schools. And, uh, you know, that's, sort of, that's the sort of thing that has a, can have a devastating impact. Busing was extremely unpopular, of course, you know, and, and he was suggesting that I was going to integrate every white, totally white school in the state by busing blacks out of the Delta to God knows where. As a kind of a last ditch, uh, desperate effort, I think, right at the end of the campaign, maybe the weekend before the election, the runoff election, Faubus announced he's going to have a press conference and he's going to have a blockbuster announcement to make. <laughs> um, and uh, I think everybody was on pins and needles waiting on this oh. blockbuster announcement, yeah. which was what? Faubus said that he had a story that was going to turn this state upside down. And we were terrified. And he was going to hold a press conference Monday morning to announce what it was. We sent Ed Lester, prominent Little Rock lawyer, to attend Faubus press conference. And Ed was to call me 
or call one of my aides, I maybe Archie was with me or whoever, the minute we knew what the blockbuster was. And now I'm this groundbreaking ceremony down at Malvern, and whoever my aide was came up to me and said, uh, Ed called, and here is the story. Faubus announced this morning that if he is elected governor, he'll be assassinated within six months. Of course, the suggestion is that if he's elected, the liberals who favor integration and all those wild-eyed schemes will kill him uh, you know, out of vengeance for defeating you. It'll be a vengeance killing. He said, that's the only thing I can figure. He didn't say that, it, and he may have some other idea in mind. But this time, I'm on my way to Pine Bluff, to the Rock Island Railroad, not to the Cotton Belt Railroad picnic. There are about a thousand people there, and all those old railroad workers were for Orville Faubus. I got up and I said, I know that most of you people here are probably going to vote for Orville Faubus. And uh, I said, but I want to tell you, you have an opportunity to save his life. And I went through the press conference. I said, he announced this morning that he's elected within six months or 60 days, I forget which it was, he'll be assassinated. That is, if he's elected. So you can help save his life by voting for me. If I'm elected, he'll have nothing to fear. You can save his life. And even all those people who were for him began to laugh, you know, and it was a kind of uproariously funny. And you know, Faubus got up and spoke, and he never alluded to that. Either before or after I spoke, he never alluded to the press conference he'd held that morning with his big bomb, with his big bomb uh, announcement. He had entered the race with only 1% name recognition, and by the first primary, half the state still didn't know who he was. But in the runoff against Orville Faubus, voters chose Dale Bumpers by a big margin. He was ready to face Winthrop Rockefeller in the general election that fall. Were you pretty sure of, 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 uh, uh, of a victory in the fall after the primaries? I mean, I think y'all had a poll that showed some mammoth lead that you had over Rockefeller after the, uh, after the primaries. After you disposed of, of Orville Faubus, did you have any doubt about uh, victory in the fall? Very little. We took a poll almost immediately after the, uh, after the Faubus election. And I think it was, it was either 60, I believe it was 72, 72 to 15, some such outrageous figure. I knew that barring a, you know, a really monumental event of some kind, and I couldn't think of what it might be, that I would win that election. But in the closing weeks of that race, Rockefeller spent a, a, an enormous tide of money, probably unprecedented, uh, certainly in, in Arkansas. And, uh, and I don't know how much eventually he wound up spending in that race. I've heard as high as $10 million. Did you begin to have some doubts in, in the fall that that, might, uh, that kind of money could turn the tide? Ernie, it was mildly worrisome, but it was really not as troublesome as you might think. And the reason I was not troubled is, you know, if you have any sensitivity at all, as I traveled around the state, people were increasingly gravitating to me. It was a remarkable time in politics in this state. It was something utterly different from anything anybody had ever seen. We had a slogan, which was, I didn't think much of it at the time, but the more I thought about it and reflected on it, I thought it was perfect. I said, let's get our state together. The state had become so uh, riddled with dissension. Uh, Rockefeller couldn't get anything done because he was a Republican and the Democrats, the Democrats totally controlled the legislature. And the people in the state were tired of the fighting. Rockefeller was not a gifted campaigner. He was a man who was ill at ease behind a microphone. Uh, he searched for words. He, his vocabulary, I'm sure, was adequate, but he couldn't find the word he wanted oftentimes. And he was very hesitant. And when he did say something negative, he'd always sort of smile because it didn't, it didn't become him and he didn't feel comfortable doing it. But getting back to the point, I can't think of a single time that fall where I felt that I was really threatened with a defeat. Rockefeller's uh, uh, campaign and, and often Rockefeller himself uh, implied that 
if you got elected, um, things wouldn't be any different. The same old crowd would be running the show, uh, the same, and he didn't identify who that old crowd was. Uh, but certainly would include Witt Stevens. He was the, the kingmaker of Arkansas politics from the 1940s into the 1980s probably and got very close to every single governor, whether he supported him at the outset or not. He became uh, an ally of, uh, of every governor, except you. He didn't support you in that race, did he? No. I went to see him one time when I was thinking about running. This was long before I announced. Uh, Martin Burkett, who had been, was, had been mayor of Little Rock, wanted me to see Whit Stevens, so I went to see him. But uh, I had also sued Stevens Production Company, their gas company, several times. And so when I walked in, and Martin introduced me to Whit Stevens, he said, oh yeah, I know him, he used to, he used to sue hell out of us. And we had a very congenial conversation. I didn't ask him for his uh, support in the governor's race, and he didn't tender it. Politicians still wanted him because of his money. And in, in those days, you could contribute any amount you wanted to in a governor's race. And, you know, if you got wet on your side, that meant quite a bit of money, or at least it was perceived as meaning a lot of money. But uh, I didn't, frankly, much want Whit Stevens on my side. I had nothing particularly against him, but he represented the past in this state. And people I knew saw in me, those who were paying any attention at all, saw me as a new kind of leader whom they were willing to give a chance. Well, you won roughly two to one. Uh, the margin was not quite as big as I guess is in that first poll, but anyway, it was a dramatic victory. Many hundreds and hundreds of people went to work for us that I have, had never met, still have never met. And uh, I, I don't want to sound trite or political, but I think it really was a people's victory. Rockefeller did you one big favor. Oh. That was the day before, I believe it was the day before your inauguration. It was the night before the inauguration. night before the inauguration. Uh, signed a proclamation or executive order uh, granting clemency to everybody on death row, commuted their sentences to uh, life imprisonment. What were the 12, 13, 13? 13. 13 people on death row. The fact that he did that didn't really create much of a furor. You would have thought that everybody would have been standing on their head for the governor to just arbitrarily and summarily uh, say these 13 men don't deserve to die, I don't believe in the death penalty, and I'm commuting all of them to life in prison. And you would have thought there'd be a, a real outcry, but there wasn't. But I can tell you he removed a tremendous burden from me because that's something I, I had sort of laid awake at night thinking about. The first commutation that came to my desk was I going to sentence somebody to die. What it meant was that in, in, in the four years you were there, you never had to face that decision. Uh, never that, faced that, a single decision. Did there reach a point in that first year or two years you were in office when you just felt overwhelmed? I mean, this, this was obviously yes. uh, burdens that you'd never uh, uh, had to deal with before. Well, in the early days, uh, it was rather frightening. A lot of people would not have been frightened, but I was. I don't mean terrified or frightened for my life, but just frightened about the scope and the magnitude of what I was about to do. And realizing that I was just, after all, a country lawyer. With no, I hadn't been in the legislature. I had no idea the way this whole apparatus worked. And I can remember getting really uh, upset about whether my inaugural address was up to the, to the occasion or not, whether it was really a good speech one that I wanted to use to set the tone for my administration. I had I'd just been sworn in that morning and I was thinking about all kinds of things that could go wrong and it was a, it was a very apprehensive time. In the elections of 1970, there had been a massive turnover in the Arkansas House. Some of the old guard legislators who'd been there since the Faubus era were replaced by young reformers. Bumpers passed many progressive initiatives, including the first state-sponsored kindergarten program, increases in teacher salaries, and free textbooks for high school students. The first thing Bumpers did as governor was pass a bill revamping the executive branch of state government, reducing the number of state agencies that report to the governor from 67 to 13 cabinet departments. It was obvious that uh, 67 departments was just uh, uh, chaos, 
My brother had been climbing the corporate ladder in America and was president of a large corporation at the time. And I discussed that with him. And he said, little brother, when you've got 67 people reporting to you, that's going to be like a fire drill. Nobody can run a company and have 67 department heads reporting to him. I don't know what the right number is, but I can tell you that's absurd. But that turned out probably to be the most important thing I did while I was governor, was that, was that uh, reorganization of state government. Well, certainly the next most important thing would have been uh, taxes. Uh, at what point did you decide we're going to have to raise taxes to, and, and not just a minimal amount, we're going to have to have a major tax program? There was absolutely no question that this state was going to sink if we didn't raise taxes. And I dreaded it. I hated it. I knew it was going to be politically unpopular and difficult to get through the legislature. And what I did was ask for an increase from 5% to 9% of the income tax. Legislators for the dozens came through my office saying, we ought to go for the sales tax. We can get the sales tax passed. We'll never get the income tax passed. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. That tax is regressive. It hurts poor people. And we're going for the income tax. Did they tell you it's impossible to raise the income tax because yes. it takes a three-fourths vote? Yes, that's another thing, incidentally. Yeah. Most people don't realize that, but uh, uh, back when uh, the rich folks were in charge, of course, they made sure that raising the income tax took 75% vote to pass the sales tax, which is one the poor folks had to pay, only took a 50% vote. It was one of the most anachronistic things I ever saw in my life. But uh, that also, I think, Ernie, we had, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm afraid to say it, I think we had nine votes in the Senate before we finally got that thing passed. There were quite a few. One of the bills that I've taken, most, uh, taken credit for, and justly so, and one that I'm proudest of, was the community college bill. We only had two community colleges. And so when I, when I put this bill down there to expand the community colleges and trade schools, and some in combination, community colleges with trade schools, the four-year colleges went berserk. All you're doing is taking the money away from us and we're already starving to death. And I said, yes, and there are a lot of children in this country that would like to go to college that can't afford to go to the University of Arkansas. And if they could go to one nearby, even in their hometown for a couple of years, you'd, they could do it, they could do it and they'd be benefit from it, but more importantly, they'd know whether they were college material or not. And, uh, you know, long and short of it, as we sit here and speak right now, I think there are 22 to 27 of those colleges, and every one of them are doing extremely well. I guess you got probably at least 95% of all the administration bills that you, uh, that you proposed, about 95% or more passed. Amazing record. Yet you had no experience. You go into, the, into this legislative session, you've had no experience uh, with the legislature. How were you able to do that? How were you able to develop the, the kind of skills to, uh, to lobby the legislature to get, uh, get all of this, this passed? Ernie, I'd like to think that was a matter of just earned respect because administrative skills are not as important as what you believe. You know, it's not as important as, as your values and the way you champion those values and your commitment to them. And everybody in that legislature knew that I was really working hard to make this state better than it had ever been, to increase people's pride in the state, and to let the rest of the country know that the school integration crisis was behind us. We were a new state. And I harped on that continually. And I was fairly young at the time, and there was a lot of talk about this new, young, aggressive uh, articulate governor in Arkansas, and as I say, I just played on that, and people, there was, there was no magic to it, and it's true, I didn't have any administrative skills then, I don't have any administrative skills to speak of now, but I did know what I believed, and I, and I knew what I thought this state needed, and uh, as I tra traveled around this state when I was running, I'd go to the state parks, they were just a disaster. There wasn't a state park in the state that I could recommend to a friend of mine if he came to this state to spend a day or an evening or a night in it. And we, we appropriated, listen to this, we appropriated more money the first year I was governor to improve the state park system and add a couple of parks than had been appropriated in the entire history of the state. 
and everybody said, hooray. Nobody squawked about that. Everybody knew our state parks were a disaster, and now we have a great state park system, and we began it then. That, that was not a case of administrative skills. That was a case of common sense, and I knew that we ought to do it. You've often, over the years, mentioned one failure uh, of, uh, in that first legislative session, and that was a, uh, a bill that would have uh, set aside wilderness areas. I, w I was just naturally concerned about the environment. I don't know why I'd always been concerned about the streams and the lakes and the forest. It was just a sort of a thing with me. I was a hunter, as a matter of fact. I was a quail hunter, and I believed in saving as much property as we could. I decided we ought to set some side, aside some land here. Congress was beginning to talk about it. And so to make this story short, I put a wilderness bill up there, and, it, and I never could get it passed. There, it was a concept that was not alien to them. It's just they didn't understand it. Anything they didn't understand, they didn't want to have anything to do with. And I remember old Virgil Fletcher, who was a senator, state senator from down at, uh, I guess, Malvern or Bennett, Benton. And I never will forget his statement. He says, we don't need no wilderness. If we ever need a wilderness, we'll grow one. <laughs> as his first term as governor came to a close, people began to speculate if he would run for a second term or challenge Senator John McClellan. I, I think John McClellan was quite certain I was going to run against him. I'd never said anything to anybody to lead him to believe that. But I, I thought that reorganization of state government was so important that it needed a little more tender care, a little more shepherding. And I felt that if I left after one term, I'd sort of be betraying the people too. Nobody ever, I mean, it, it would have been, it would have looked terribly ambitious to just run for governor, get elected for a two-year term and then run for the Senate. I don't mind telling you this is a terrible thing to say, but I think I'd have probably been elected if I had, but I just did, I didn't really seriously consider it. Bumpers beat four opponents in the Democratic primary of 1972. He was easily elected to a second term as governor. In 1973, commodity prices went through the roof. The income tax increase that Bumpers had passed in the previous session began to come in, filling state coffers. Arkansas farmers made so much money they didn't know what to do. We had, said, we had told people that that income tax was going to raise something like $26 million. It turned out to raise $56 million. And I felt terrible about, you know, it looked like I had misled them, but what was happening was uh, soybeans went up to 12 13 rice was $15 a bushel, soybeans $12 a bushel. And when we began to collect that income tax, it was staggering. The treasurer, I had to call a special session in 1974 to spend the money. And that's where we built all the all buildings the on the college campuses and maybe even expanded one prison. Uh, I don't think there was a single university or college in the state that we didn't put a, a significant improvement on. You enjoyed uh, four years in office without, without a hint of scandal. And, uh, and I don't recall even any uh, allegations of, of scandal uh, while you were in office. Uh, were you ever offered any gifts while you were governor? Yes. And Betty was shopping Cone's department store, which was the biggest department store in town at the time. And she was shopping, and a salesman hollered at her and says, Ms. Bumpers, and she, he came over to her, and she said, yes. And she said, your husband has a suit here. She said, what do you mean he has a suit here? And she said, well, a man left money here for a new suit of clothes for the governor. And we wanted him to come down and pick it up. And she said, well, you can send him his money back because the governor won't accept it. And he said, he won't? And she said, no. And he said, I can't tell you how pleased I am to hear that. People can smell dishonesty. I mean, you know, if they, if they think the governor's viable or, you know, can be had, they'll swarm him. They'll be in there. But once the word gets out that this governor's not for sale and he's real and so on, you won't be bothered, and I really wasn't bothered very much. I knew, I, I knew, just as a commonsensical thing, that if I was going to be a successful governor, it would be as much because of the things that didn't happen as because of the things that did. You mentioned Betty. How did public life affect her? Betty loved every minute of it. She, uh, she loved meeting people. She loved doing things that she thought was, uh, that were important. 
And as you know, she spent about a year, the first year, actually pouring tea and uh, presiding over mansion parties and so on. But ultimately, she started, she decided she wanted to do something about the low rate of childhood immunizations in this state. And so she took that on. It was called Every Child in 74, was that 74. it? Yeah. And of course, you know, they wound up, I remember that well, immunizing 300,000 kids one Saturday, just one Saturday. But she got the bug and became really a sort of a nationally known figure in the childhood immunization program well, this, and is still yeah. nationally known. There, there are, that, that effort that year became a, kind of a prototype, I guess, for immunization. And, they and have nice established, uh, you know, they have established registries, which is what she always said. She told me after the, that Saturday they immunized 300,000 kids, she said, you know, this is good for your political career to immunize 300,000 kids. But she said, this is not a solution. The solution is to start keeping up with babies from the day they're born on a national registry and keeping up with their immunizations on that national registry. And you know, as of this moment, that for the first time is coming into existence. And it was Betty's idea, and it's like, kind of hurt my feelings when she said, this is good for your political career, but uh, it's, it's not a solution. In 1974, Bumpers was faced with a decision about the next step in his political career to run for a third term as governor or to seek a higher office. Both Congressman John Paul Hammerschmidt and Senator J. William Fulbright were up for re-election. Fulbright had held his Senate seat for nearly 30 years as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and an opponent of the Vietnam War. He was a powerful, nationally known figure. My, my goal was not to be governor. It was to be either in the House of Representatives or the Senate. And so I chose the governor's office as a stepping stone only in trying to get to the Senate because that was my goal. And frankly, my father convinced me I could be president. And I thought the Senate would be a great stepping stone to the presidency. And running against Fulbright was a very, very difficult decision. I had been a Fulbright fan. I had voted for him. I had worked for him. Running against Fulbright made that decision so agonizing. And I finally made it. And one of the reasons I made it was because I was convinced that Bill Fulbright was going to get beat. That was not an opportunistic idea uh, to say, well, he was going to get beat anyway, and so I'll just run against him. The reason I believe that is because we took a poll, and it showed that he was incredibly weak. Uh, I don't know quite what the genesis of it was. He had been a very ardent opponent of the Vietnamese War, the Vietnam War. I think a lot of people were coming to the conclusion that the war was wrong. He had been right all along. Uh, the people had been wrong. They may have resented that, that he was right and they were wrong. I don't know, but I know one thing. There was also a feeling that on the Foreign Relations Committee, he was not taking care of Arkansas's business. That had been a seething sort of undercurrent for a long time. I never will forget the, the uh, gridiron show here one time, or the Fargoberry Follies. I think it was in the Fargoberry Follies. One skit showed Fulbright getting off an airplane with his colored glasses and his little British hat, uh, British tweed coat, Wall Street Journal out of his pocket, colored glasses. He gets off the plane, looks around, and said, my, my, such poverty. Do these people realize they're entitled to foreign aid? Well, that was funny, but it was also devastating. It showed that people in this state, that was a reflection of the way people sort of felt, that he was not in touch with the people back home. He wasn't getting highway money and dam money and all kinds of buildings and construction. He left like, that up to McClellan to do those He left that to John McClellan, and rightly so. John McClellan was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He could get anything he wanted. But anyway, we took a poll that showed that I would beat Bill Fulbright two to one. And it showed that Sid McMath, I've never said this out loud before, it showed that Sid McMath ran dead even with him. Uh, I don't know, you know, I, I, I doubt that Sid would have beat him. He might have. But the fact that Sid was running dead even, and Sid was getting up in years then too, you know, uh, people were not likely to have elected him because they'd want somebody younger that could start establishing seniority. So it was a very, it was a crushing decision to make, but I made it. 
it was a, an unusual campaign in that the, the two of you uh, disagreed on almost nothing during the campaign, except on seniority. He uh, was yeah. Senator Fulbright talked a lot about the importance of seniority, and you kind of diminished the importance of seniority. Uh, but beyond that, on issues, there was almost no distinction, uh, differences between you on, uh, on issues during that campaign. In just four years, Dale Bumpers had transformed himself from unknown country lawyer to political giant killer. He defeated Orville Faubus and Wynne Rockefeller to become governor in 1970. And in 1974, he fulfilled a childhood dream, defeating J. William Fulbright to become a United States Senator. He was sworn into the Senate in January 1975. Soon after, people began to speculate that he might throw his hat into an even bigger political ring and won for president in 1976. You went to the Senate in, in uh, January of 1975. It wasn't long before the, the presidential race of 1976 was underway. And almost from the day you got to the Senate, there was speculation that you might uh, run for the Senate, run, run for president in 1976. And obviously you considered that. Did you not, did you not consider that? And, and, and what, what uh, changed your mind about running? In 1975, by the middle of 1975, I was given serious consideration to running in 1976. And uh, without going into all of, all of my innermost thoughts about it, I, I can tell you now, as I felt then, that I would probably never have a better opportunity to be president. This was post-Watergate. People were looking for new faces, looking for new ideas, looking for people they could trust. And Jimmy Carter and I had been elected governor the same year, 1970. He was elected governor of Georgia, of course, and I of Arkansas. And I thought that 1976 was going to be a golden time to run. But I finally decided that the raising of the money was going to be virtually impossible for an unknown, plus the fact that I hadn't really even acclimated myself to the way the Senate operated. I concluded that, that I probably should not do it. And I will say this. And there again, this is not very becoming of me to say this, but I will anyway. I really feel to this day that had I run, I would have had an excellent chance of being elected. I probably made a cerebral, uh, cerebrally correct decision. Politically, it was a bad decision. I think that I would have had an excellent chance of being elected that year. The Panama Canal Treaty, I have always said, that the Panama Canal Treaties, in my 24 years in the Senate, was easily the most volatile, dangerous vote that I cast and most others. Why was it so volatile an issue? Well, the Republicans made it one. The right wing in this country were just, they were just going ballistic. And the Panama Canal had been, I don't know, it, it wasn't on people's minds until this came up. But once it did, they'd say, you know, we built it, it's ours. Or it's, as Senator Hayakawa of California said, we stole it fair and square, and the truth of the matter is that's what had happened. We had literally stolen the thing. Henry Bellman, in my opinion, was sort of the hero of that vote. He was His, a senator from Oklahoma. Sen Henry Republican. Bellman was a senator from Oklahoma, had former governor, and Henry Bellman got up just before we voted, and I bet he didn't take two minutes to say, if the Panama Canal were across America, you know how you'd feel about it, belonging to Panama. And he said, I think we ought to treat the Panamanians the same way we'd want to be treated if the circumstances were reversed. At the, at when you decided to cast your vote for it and to speak for it, uh, did you know that it was that volatile? Yes. Issue, that, it, that it was that perilous? Did I know? Let me give you an illustration. The last three weeks before we voted, we were averaging between 3,000 and 3,300 phone calls and letters a day. We couldn't even begin to keep up with the mail. We never had anything before or after that that even came close to generating that kind of response. It was that vote that, in my opinion, had more to do with Ronald Reagan's beating Jimmy Carter in 1980 and the Senate being taken over lock, stock, and barrel by the Republicans. In my opinion, the Panama Canal treaties we're more responsible for that than any other single factor. Bumpers was elected to his second term in 1980. Ronald Reagan took office in 1981 and proposed to balance the budget while cutting taxes and increasing defense spending. 
Reagan's popularity was extremely high at the time, and uh, people were afraid to challenge him. But you think for a minute, Ernie, about the, the superciliousness of a proposition that says we're going to increase defense spending by a monumental amount, and we're going to cut taxes. And all of this, all of this sponsored by a man who says, I will balance the budget by 1984, and I may be even able to do it in 1983. I voted for the spending cuts, and I voted against the tax cuts, and I voted against the defense, big defense increases. But uh, the tax cut turned out to be astronomical. And any time a man talks about balancing the budget and economic policy and the essentials of being conservative, as the deficit climbs from $67 billion, which it was the year before he took office, and is approaching $300 billion a year when he leaves office, how anybody could consider that a successful presidency is beyond me. I, I get uh, almost salivating talking about it, and I know this is not becoming of me. This is not my nature to say this on television, but I consider it the worst presidency just about in modern times. 1984, uh, Ronald Reagan runs for president again, obviously he's re-elected by a big margin. And you, I think that is the, the year that you made your most serious That's right. stab at running for president. In fact, I think you went out to uh, Sacramento, California, I and did. maybe a couple of the early kind of what they call cattle shows where all the Democratic, yes. potential Democratic candidates uh, talked and everybody could, uh, could take a look at the, at the field. But yet uh, you uh, pretty early backed out and decided you were not going to make that race. Uh, why? I knew that Ronald Reagan was going to be reelected. By that time, the recession of the 81 and 82 had let up and things were getting rather prosperous. Of course, as I always said, you let me write $200 billion worth of hot checks a year and I'll show you a good time too. And things were beginning to pick up. And uh, I knew that he was probably in, uh, you know, in, in vulnerable in 1984. And so I ultimately made the decision that I would not run. And then in 1988, which is the year that uh, Michael Dukakis won the Democratic nomination, you, uh, you toyed with it that year as well, but uh, you didn't go as far as you did in, in, in 19... Uh, I did not. For some reason or other, I, in 87, I had lost a little of my enthusiasm for being president. And uh, I'm not sure what all went into my thoughts, but I backed out of that one early. Bill Clinton got interested once I said that I was not going to get involved in that race. Do you uh, regret it all now, not following through at some point? Yes, of course. And that's the first time I've ever said that. But, and it took me a long time to come around to that idea. Another thing that I also have to say, Ernie, is my mother was Irish. She always taught us that no matter how good things were, there was an abyss ahead of us, you know. There was some kind of disaster waiting for us, no matter how well things were going. And uh, I'm afflicted with that, badly afflicted with that. And my angst knows no bounds sometimes about things that don't amount to anything. I can remember three or four things that upset me when I was governor and senator that almost drove me crazy. Of course, politics is a dirty business at times. It can get really nasty. And you're at, you've got adversaries everywhere, anxious to bring you down. And I used to spend a lot of sleepless nights. And I knew that if I ran for president, it would probably kill me. I don't want to overstate the case, but I mean, it's just the sort of thing. I wound up having a heart attack, you know, in 1996, and uh, it would have come much earlier than that if I had been in the White House. The Senate, of course, is historically great debating society. You had, you know, Webster and William Jennings Bryan and Calhoun. Things had changed, I think, by the time you went to the Senate. But did you think that your uh, skills as a debater, honed as a country lawyer in, in, uh, in Arkansas, would, uh, would stand you in good stead in the Senate, would be an advantage in the Senate, and did it turn out to be? It never occurred to me, really, that uh, such debating skills as I had would become uh, would stand me in good stead. 
And in all fairness, it didn't work the same with the Senate as it did with the vast audience of Arkansans or with juries, because the Senate is not really a deliberative body. It might have been at one time, and I'm quite sure it was at one time, but it is anything but a deliberative body now. Nobody much deliberates on really monumental issues anymore. They decide what's good for the, for the party. You know, there's a lot of partisanship, and there's nothing wrong with partisanship. That's the reason we have two political parties, to accommodate the philosophies of the people of this country. But when the national interest is at stake, partisanship ought to be parked outside the door. I saw the Senate as a deliberative body maybe four or five times. One of those I was involved in. Am I correct that uh, as we speak, that bull bulldozers are poised to, to, in effect, attack this track, which you see. Senator, to you took my closing line. Colleagues, it's now or never. This is not something you get a second chance at. The bulldozers are down there now, and they're working in this part. I decided to try to save the Manassas battlefield. They were getting ready to build a shopping center and condominiums and golf courses and everything on 542 acres of land, which was right in the middle of the Manassas battlefield, Second Battle of Manassas, which was a critical war in the Civil, uh, a critical battle in the Civil War. The Civil War is the defining moment in the history of this country, and every bit of the history ought to be saved. So anyway, John Warner from Virginia wanted to give this guy who was going to develop it 80 acres and develop, I mean, let him uh, keep 80 acres for the battlefield and give this developer the rest of it. To me, that was silly. I believe strongly in our heritage, and I think our children ought to know where these battlefields are and what was involved in them. And I don't want to go out there 10 years from now with my grandson and tell him about the Second Battle of Manassas, and he says, well, Grandpa, wasn't General Lee in control of this war here? Didn't he command the Confederate troops? Yes, he did. Well, where was he? He's up there where that shopping mall is. I had the map showing the battle, who the Union generals were, who the Confederate generals were, how the battle developed over a period of two days. There were 75 senators who sat at rapt attention to the debate on the Battle of Manassas. I had absolutely no hope of winning that battle because it was going to cost quite a bit of money. I didn't know how much. We voted on my amendment first, and I prevailed 50 to 25, and John Warner, who had a substitute amendment, withdrew his amendment. Now, the end of that story is it cost us $100 million to buy that 542 acres. If I had known it was going to cost that much, I'm not sure I'd have had the nerve to, to, to fight that battle. But you talk to almost, well, you talk to any Civil War buff, or you talk to most, most people in Washington, Everybody remembers that evening when the Senate really was a deliberative body. Everybody was left to vote his own conscience. The leaders didn't tell anybody how to vote. And what a happy thing it would be if those kinds of debates occurred more frequently. Instances, I guess, where you uh, clearly went against the preponderant view of your constituents uh, were votes on uh, constitutional amendments amendments to, uh, to amend the Constitution, amend the Bill of Rights, uh, to prohibit busing. Later you had uh, school prayer, uh, and I guess it was only into the 90s before we had flag burning, but there were a whole variety. There, there might have been some others as well. Well, there were sure. amendments on abortion, for example. Right. Uh, just uh, everything <laughs> anybody could think of. They wanted to do an, uh, con everybody always wanted to tinker with the Constitution. I cannot tell you how deplorable I found that. It was just anathema to me. And, uh, well, that basically know, kind of established your reputation, I think, nationally, was you're, you're, you're uh, a southern senator uh, fighting these, all these constitutional amendments that were so popular uh, in the South. Well, it was, I, I think it was a little more difficult, of course, being a southerner to champion the positions I, I took. But I have a tendency to believe that there are certain values that uh, don't have geographical boundaries. I think that for example, when it came to prayer in school, I never will forget in 1986, I was the only Southern senator that voted against the so-called prayer in school amendment. 
That amendment was a very poorly crafted amendment that said, while the school board itself could not craft these prayers to be recited by children, they could adopt prayers. And what, they would have been, what the fight would have been, every television evangelist in the country would have been trying to get control of the local school boards so it would be their prayers the school board would adopt. And I said, if you believe in that, I never did this. I, I never believed in saying, if you believe that, don't vote for me. But that night I did. I said, I don't believe in that, and I don't think you do either. But if you do, don't vote for me. I will never vote for a constitutional amendment like that. Bumpers was elected to a fourth term in 1992. It was the last Senate race he would make. He developed a reputation for fighting big spending projects, and the project he opposed most vehemently was construction of a manned space station. We have developed a spacesuit. There is no great demand for spacesuits in our nation. There is a great need to reduce crime, to feed the hungry, to educate our children, to house our people, but there is no demand for spacesuits. Tell me what it's done for cancer, AIDS, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, arthritis, you name it, you tell me what single advance has been made in the last 30 years that came out of space. And when I talk about $94 billion for the cost of this thing, that's just this year. It goes up monumentally every year. I never felt more strongly about an issue than I did the space station because the space station, it was just so powerfully clear that the cost and the, the cost-benefit ratio was just totally out of, out, irrelevant. I want to tell you this, Ernie. Of course, as you know, I ultimately lost that battle and they continued to build the space station and are in the process of building it right now. But, you know, I pick up articles in the New York Times and Washington Post that look like speeches I made on the floor, almost word for word, about the skyrocketing cost. I had estimated originally when I took that on that all the cost of the space station from the beginning would run $75 billion, then 90, then 100, then 105. The space station isn't in place now and the costs continue to spiral out of control. And uh, every time I read one of those stories and the answers of NASA to why the costs are out of control, I just have to smile a little bit. You know, there's nothing a politician enjoys more than saying, I told you so. Uh, in 1998, you decided not to run again. You'd served four terms, 24 years in the Senate. Why? Why did you decide not to run? What got you thinking? I had gotten almost despondent about the way the Senate operated and about my inability to get things done that I really cared a lot about. Uh, frankly, I always thought we spent way too much money on defense. The military got whatever they wanted first, everybody got what was left. It was always out of kilter. We never could make up our mind because of the parochial interest. And I was as guilty as anybody. I don't know how many times I had to go to bat for weapon systems were built in Camden, Arkansas because the jobs down there were so important. But every single thing that came up, you put it through a little filter in your brain. You know, how is this going to affect my money supply? Do the people who give me a thousand or two thousand dollars every time I run, are they going to be alienated by this vote? Is it going to cost jobs in Forest City or Fort Smith or Pine Bluff? Are they going to lose anything out of this? Somebody can use that against you? All those political considerations, if they lined up, if just like the stars lining up, then the last thing you considered was the merit of the case. Was it meritorious? It seemed to me that we'd gotten to the point where the things that really ought to matter in this country were, were, were being considered last. In Bumper's last year as a senator, articles of impeachment were brought against President Clinton. Bumper's retired in January of 1999 and had only been out of office for two weeks when Iowa Senator Tom Harkin suggested that he present the closing arguments for Clinton's defense in the Senate impeachment trial. I said, well, Tom, 
Everybody in the Senate knows that Bill Clinton and I are both from Arkansas. They know we've been friends for 20 years, 25 years. I'm not credible talking about Bill Clinton. Nobody's going to listen to me. He said, <clears throat> you couldn't be more wrong. That's the reason you should do it. Because of that, you can say things that nobody else can say. When I first talked to him, and I said, Bill, I've been trying to think what I would say that would be credible. I said, I can think of a lot of arguments. I can kick Kenneth Starr and be happy to do it. I can talk about what he has done to the state of Arkansas, what he's done to the country. And, uh, but I said, the one thing I can do, you and Tom Harkin both kept talking about what I could do that nobody else could do simply because of our long friendship. It's coming from the same state. I said, I've been thinking of the hundreds of times that you and I have been together, political functions, social functions, personal visits, of all those hundreds of times, most of them in public, I've never seen you conduct yourself in a way that didn't reflect credit on you and your family and the state and the country. He said, damn, I like that. I said, well, <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of right now along the credibility line that might, that might work. And so it, it did work. If high crimes and misdemeanors was taken from English law by George Mason, which listed high crimes and misdemeanors as political offenses against the state, what are we doing here? So colleagues, if you honor the Constitution, you must look at the history of the Constitution and how we got to the impeachment clause. And if you do that, and you do that honestly according to the oath you took, you cannot, you can censor Bill Clinton, you can hand him over to the prosecutor for him to be prosecuted, but you cannot convict him. And you cannot indulge yourselves the luxury or the right to ignore this history. It goes without saying that President Clinton was a magnet for the haters in this country. Uh, the extreme right wing and others for other maybe ideological reasons detested Bill Clinton. And that's one of the reasons for the trial in the first place. It's really, it's really a tragedy. He was, you know, like all of us, had uh, some flaws. You know, he was uh, sorely tempted. But if it had not been for that, if it had not been for some of the character flaws that developed, he'd go down in history as one of the best presidents the country ever had. I think he still will. What do you think is your legacy? I'd say the two or three things you're proudest of, all of your public life. Well, I'll tell you, Ernie, you, you can't talk about a legacy without being slightly egotistical sounding or arrogant sounding. And the thing that sustained me in politics, because I was obviously more liberal than the people of the state, and the thing that sustained me and allowed me to be reelected was that people, even though they may disagree with you, if they think you're standing up for what you believe, they're pretty forgiving. And so in the, particularly the last 18 years I was in the Senate, people would say, I don't agree with Senator Bumpers, but at least he stands up for what he believes. Now that is a legacy in which I take great pride. Dale Bumpers devoted a great portion of his life to public service, serving on the Charleston School Board, four years as governor of Arkansas, and 24 years in the United States Senate. In his retirement, Bumpers has returned to his roots as a lawyer, this time with the Washington firm of Eric Fox. Thank you for joining us for this series on one of Arkansas's men of distinction, Dale Bumpers. I'm Ernie Dumas. Thanks for watching.
To learn more about the Men and Women of Distinction series, visit our website at www.aetn.org. This program was made possible by a grant from the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, your local energy partner.